Greetings, gentles and ladiesmen. Exaparadigm Gamer here. Hopefully you enjoyed my remake or rebreak on Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2. While that was intended to be the final video of the Dreamcast era Sonic Marathon and sort of tie up all the loose ends, since releasing the videos, I've been thinking a lot about a certain subject, and I'd like to get these thoughts off of my chest. Seeing as I haven't done one of these editorials in a long while, and that my musings have little to do with the specific game, or with Sonic in particular, I figured I might as well wrap things up here in a separate video. As you can see, I'm not going to be too editing intensive with this one, as I've got a whole new marathon coming up that i got to work on, so please excuse the lack of visual variety. One thing I've learned, especially since joining YouTube in 2013, is just how conflicted the gaming community is. The fact is, all of us come from wildly different gaming backgrounds, skill levels, genre preferences, etc. The only thing we truly have in common is that we all play a lot of video games, and this recreation means a lot to us for one reason or another. Beyond that, however, there's a lot of difference of opinion as to what makes for good game design. One of the biggest debates in the gaming community revolves around the question of approachability and mechanical socialization. Should games be accessible and laden with helpful information for less experienced players, or should they be balls to the wall hard and demand players pick up mechanics from context clues? There are many other similar debates raging within specific fan bases, and that means that being part of the gaming community can be very stressful and tiring. It seems like you can't express a simple opinion without pissing at least one person off, as though it's some sort of zero-sum game where legitimacy is measured by the numbers of people occupying a particular stance. I've been a fervent defender of the Nintendo Game Boy Advance in my years on YouTube, primarily for the many ports or remakes of various classics on NES and SNES. I think most of these ports, with some very obvious exceptions, are at least decent transitions that made a good faith effort to bring console quality games to a handheld. There were some hiccups along the way, many of them due to the idiosyncrasies of the G but for the most part, I think they're competent versions to own that are worth the price of admission. But time and time again, I've received comments from angry viewers telling me that I'm wrong for defending these re-releases. The resolution is terrible. The saturation is terrible. The sound quality is terrible. The screen crunch is unplayable. The voice clips sound like r etc. They accuse me of being some kid who doesn't know any better and demand that I apologize for my insolence. It's true that I did grow up with many of these GBA ports and that the GBA was one of my first video game systems in general. I have no doubt that these experiences affect my views of Super Mario Advance or Donkey Kong Country or Link to the Past Four Swords, but it apparently never occurred to these GBA reactionaries that their experience growing up with the NES and SNES originals could have a similar effect on how they viewed those versions of the games, as though my generation is the only one capable of nostalgia bias. On the one hand, I totally understand why people dislike these ports and prefer the originals. On the other hand, a lot of their complaints are either greatly exaggerated, like the screen crunch complaint, or they relate to that person's aesthetic taste, in the case of music. I'm not saying that GBA reactionaries don't have a case, or that they don't have a right to their opinion. I'm saying that many of them feel the need to over-criticize the alternative to make their preferred version look artificially better, and I do have a problem with that. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, the case of GBA re-releases is not the only instance of using excessive criticism to artificially increase the legitimacy of an opinion. A similar pattern is occurring in the Zelda fanbase right now. Once upon a time, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was considered among the greatest video games ever made, and many people still hold it near and dear to them today. More recently, however, a two-pronged movement has conspired to dethrone the game and call it out as a watered-down Zelda experience that doesn't deserve the love and attention given to it. On one hand, you have a crowd of people who really liked the previous console Zelda game, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past for SNES, and on the other hand, you have a crowd of people who really like the following console Zelda game, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. The former crowd believes in the primacy of 2D Zelda gameplay over 3D Zelda, and prefers A Link to the Past more hands-off approach to storytelling, while the latter was annoyed with the previously unenthusiastic treatment of Majora's Mask compared to its predecessor, and wanted to show all of the ways the game improved and innovated upon it. While it's great that these two titles are getting more appreciation and love from the community, once again, the fanbase is treating this process like it's a zero-sum game, as though increasing our love for Majora and A Link to the Past necessarily entails decreasing our love for Ocarina of Time. Many people have gone out of their way to bash the story, saying it's too basic and is essentially copy-pasted from A Link to the Past. Others criticize it for being too generic and for starting a trend of Zelda focusing too much on story. Again, liking any of these games the most is perfectly legitimate. You're welcome to prefer whichever you'd like for reasons that make 
make sense to you. What I don't like is how people feel the need to over-criticize the alternatives as a means of artificially increasing the legitimacy of their opinion. It's not necessary, and it leaves a dedicated population of Zelda fans saddled with the difficult task of convincing their fellows that Ocarina is still a great Zelda game in its own right, if not necessarily the best. While we're talking about games that are over-criticized, how about Twilight Princess? I've always loved this game, but it gets a lot of flack over things that really aren't a big deal, as though people need to justify their preference for Wind Waker by making this game look as bad as possible. I've heard people tell me that the normal battle music playing during the Midna's Lament sequence is apparently a big deal, or that the game is too easy, or that hunting for shadow bugs is the worst thing ever, despite the game providing the player with every tool to make it as convenient as possible. Let's also not forget that Wind Waker had the Triforce Shard quest, which is debatably as annoying as shadow bug hunts, and that the original version of that game was also pretty easy. Again, if you prefer Wind Waker, that's fine, but you don't have to throw Twilight Princess under the bus to justify your opinion. It's enough to say that you prefer Wind Waker for reasons that matter to you. And that brings me to the title of this video, the gaming community and the mindset that being more critical means being more objective. In a hugely complex social entity such as the gaming community, we have to set certain norms to help give it form, substance, and consistency. In regards to opinions of games and game design, we have adopted a belief system that grants more value to opinions we regard as rational and impartial, and which devalues opinions we perceive as biased and irrational. Again, this judgment is ultimately left to the individual, but I think most people would see this as the intersubjective standard. Despite this, the community has also adopted general standards of what objectivity, rationality, and impartiality entails. In today's gaming community, many people seem to subscribe to this ideology that being rational and objective means criticizing games as much as you possibly can. Just so you know, I don't mean ideology in the political sense, but in the sociological one. It's a dense concept, but an ideology is basically a set of culturally conditioned claims that are taken for granted. What this mindset entails is that it's not enough to simply identify the major flaws that really detract from the experience. You have to go out of your way to discuss every technical glitch, every plot hole, every mildly inconvenient design choice, everything. None of these things are simply minor drawbacks that are negligible in the grand scheme of things. They are massive flaws that cause the game to fall flat on its face. And if you disagree, then you're being unobjective. If you challenge people espousing these values, you're going to get a lot of the same reactions. They'll call you a kid, accuse you of being nostalgic, and say that you only like the game because you grew up with it and have become accustomed to its flaws. There's probably a kernel of truth to some of these claims, but it seems a lot of people aren't willing to entertain the notion that it might just be someone else's personal taste, and instead assume that the person must be irrational or biased in some way. Exacerbating the situation is the effect that Bagot status, that stands for best game of all time by the way, brings to opposing perspectives on a game. Many of the most over-criticized games in modern gaming were at one point people's most favorite games. Just look at the reaction to The Last of Us. By all accounts, it's a great game and one of Naughty Dog's most ambitious titles. But there was such a split reaction to it. Critics, it's safe to say, over-glorified the game, consistently plastering the gaming news media with perfect tens and Game of the Year awards. Many average gamers were just as enthusiastic, but many more went out of their way to trash the game, saying it was overrated, uninnovative, and had poor gameplay. Apparently it never occurred to any of these people, including myself at the time, that The Last of Us is a great game that's not going to have the same appeal for everyone. Do I think critics were pushing it when they called it the best game of the generation? Absolutely. Do I think the naysayers are right to call it a piece of trash? Absolutely not. Again, it's a great game that's not going to do the same things for everyone, but the naysayers assume that their case is worth more because they're going out of their way to nitpick what's wrong with the game, instead of settling for something that's great enough the way it is. So what does this ideology of overcriticalism have to do with the Sonic community specifically? Simply put, everything. I think it's largely responsible for the fragmentation and conflict in the fanbase today. And no, it's not just the 10% of bad eggs in the community or whatever. Even the more reasonable people fall prey to this mindset. Why is that? It's because unlike other franchises, Sonic has experimented with its gameplay considerably more. Between Sonic 3 and Knuckles and Sonic Boom The Rise of Lyric, we've experienced at least 6 or 7 gameplay styles, and people are going to react to all this variety in different ways. Some people will love all of it, some people will love 
love none of it, others will be more reactionary and demand a return to something that worked before, and others will demand that a new idea be expounded upon and become a new mainstay. And just like with any gaming franchise, Sonic has its share of bagots, and many Sonic fans of all backgrounds are dedicated to over-criticizing other people's favorite games to artificially increase the legitimacy of their own opinions. The reactionary offensive by classicists against the early 3D Dreamcast era and younger Sonic fans is a good example of this. The defensive backlash of Dreamcastians and other younger fans against the classics and older Sonic fans is a good example of this. The new wave of distaste against Sonic Unleashed colors and generations by younger and older fans is a good example of this. But the most illustrative example of all is the Sonic Adventure 1 vs Sonic Adventure 2 debate. Some people were annoyed that so many gamers were calling Sonic Adventure 2 the best Sonic game ever, and so they went out of their way to over-criticize everything about it to make it look as bad as possible and artificially increase the legitimacy of their own opinion. Minor issues like the mech controls and the emerald radar, as well as neutral design choices like the ranking system and the new approach to level design, are made out to be game-breaking flaws that ruin everything and make Sonic Adventure 2 a shitty game that's only one-third good. In doing so, these people are treating it like a zero-sum game, as though elevating Sonic Adventure 1's position in 3D Sonic quality standard necessarily entails trashing Sonic Adventure 2 as a corollary. No doubt SA2 fans have given the first Sonic Adventure a similar treatment in the past. It's a huge dialectical mess of back and forth that rips an unbridgeable cleavage in the fabric of the Sonic community. Nobody is willing to stop to admit that the two games approach Sonic game design in two distinct ways, and that no one way is necessarily objectively better than the other. I think that's what I've really picked up from watching Nick on Aqua Magna's multi-part series on the two games, and hopefully my own reviews have better allowed you to gauge each game's relative strengths and weaknesses. Obviously, I have my own position on the SA1 versus SA2 debate, and I made no secret of it, but I was also careful to remind the audience that the opposing perspective was legitimate. Like I said before, we all like games for reasons that make sense to us as individuals, so whether you prefer the first game or the second game, it's legitimate to do so. This doesn't have to be a zero-sum competition where only one of the games is good, people. Now, of course, I'm not saying that every Sonic fan or gamer follows this mindset. I'm sure there are plenty of reasonable, open-minded gamers out there who can take difference of opinion with a grain of salt and who evaluate different games as fairly as they can. I'm also not saying that I'm immune to these pressures or that I haven't fallen prey to this ideology myself. I've made my own mistakes in my years on YouTube, and I think the biggest one is my review of the first Jack and Daxter game. At the time, I was frustrated and annoyed to see all these people talk about how amazing and begote-worthy Precursor Legacy was when I felt it was just an above-average 3D platforming game. I couldn't find a review offering a worthwhile defense of the majority position, nor a review validating my own opinion, so I made a 35 minute long review debating every positive point I had heard and exaggerating every negative point I could contrive. Despite making every effort to modulate my tone, and despite trying to acknowledge some positives, you can still sense an aura of self-importance in the delivery of much of my voiceover. I was sick of people telling me that Jack and Daxter was this amazing masterpiece. I felt that the wool had been pulled over people's eyes, and that if I could just make this one video, I'd show people how lackluster the game really was. But when I sat down to review Jack 2 this past summer, I decided to rewatch my Jack 1 review and record some new stock footage of Jack 1 for the Jack 2 video, and I immediately regretted much of what I had said in my original review. I still agree with many of the points I made in that video. I do think the combat is wonky. I do think the health system is poorly implemented. I do think that Daxter is annoying, and I do wish the game had taken some time to explain the jumping mechanic for the zoomer. What I now disagree with is how much I made out of these points. The combat, while janky, isn't unplayable. While Daxter can be grating, I think I exaggerated when I called them the most annoying character in video game history. While getting this one power cell is annoying if you don't know that the zoomer can jump and drift, it is only one power cell out of 100, and it is something you can easily look up online. I still think the game is flawed, and I still don't think it's begote worthy, but I also think my original review went too far in the other direction. The game is perfectly functional, looks great for its time, and is pretty fun in spite of its flaws. It's not the best game of all time, and it's certainly not the most original game in the world, but it doesn't need to be. It's a fine game for what it is, and I regret becoming so consumed with distaste for the opinions of others that I refer to it as anything less. More recently, I've had other transformative experiences with other video games that I used to absolutely despise. In the past, I bitched about Kingdom Hearts 2 on a fairly regular basis, calling it one of my all-time least favorite games. But I bought and replayed the PS3 versions of both Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, and honestly, I 
really enjoyed both of them. Don't get me wrong, there are still things about Kingdom Hearts 2 that I don't like, but I honestly feel that past me was getting too hung up on things that really weren't that big of a deal. Hell, even the story was actually a lot better than I remembered it. Still not my favorite thing about the game, but despite its confusing nature, it was still appealing and entertaining. Believe it or not, my opinion of Star Fox Adventures for the Nintendo GameCube has improved as well. I used to think it was the worst game I had ever played, but after doing a full let's play of the game with my brother Eric over the summer, I actually think this game is... okay. I would still argue it's the worst Star Fox game by a long shot, but a lot of the parts I found insufferably terrible in my first playthrough became rather inoffensive or otherwise harmless in my second. I also realized that a lot of the things I was getting hung up on really weren't that big of a deal. Star Fox Adventures is still pretty mediocre all things considered, but can I call it the worst game I've ever played? No, I can't. And I can kind of understand why some people really really like it. I'll never be one of them, but still. What I'm trying to get at here is that making content on YouTube has taught me that being objective, rational, and impartial doesn't mean being overly critical of something for its own sake. And it's certainly not about telling people why they're wrong for liking something that you don't. Yes, it's important to criticize a game when it does something wrong, but it's also important not to make mountains out of molehills. Impartiality entails seeing both the good and the bad in a game. It entails looking at everything as a package and recognizing when things are good enough. It's taken years of writing scripts, recording voiceovers, and editing videos for me to figure this out, but I'm glad that I did. Honestly, evaluating games this way allows me to enjoy myself so much more. Becoming so hung up on what a game does wrong that you become unable to enjoy anything doesn't benefit anyone. Do you have to love every game you play? Certainly not, but try not to let the opinions of others send you too far in the other direction, because mercilessly criticizing a game and ignoring its strengths is no more impartial than overly praising a game and ignoring its flaws. So what should you take away from this video? I'm asking you to try two things. Don't let someone else's positive opinion of a game steer you too far in the other direction. It's important to recognize things that a game does wrong, but it's also important not to make mountains out of molehills. Difference of opinion and taste is inevitable. If we want to bring better social cohesion and stability to the gaming community, the best way I can think to do that is to acknowledge that other people's tastes and preferences are just as valid as our own, and that there's no zero-sum competition going on whereby games decrease in reputation as comparable games increase. In fact, one why not give some of these games another playthrough? Who knows? Maybe you'll have the same experience I did with Kingdom Hearts 2 and Star Fox Adventures. So yeah, go enjoy your evening, and I'll see you guys next time with the brand new Remake or Rebreak episode of a series I've been wanting to cover for years. Until next time, I'm Exa Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you enjoyed the editorial.